Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Play and Pretend with me, Chris McIlvenny. This week I am joined by the absolutely hilarious Paddy McDonnell. He's an absolute legend, you're going to love it. Here he is, Paddy McDonnell. Uh, Paddy McDonnell, thank you very much for doing this, how are you? Dead on, but I'm good, how are you? Yeah, dead on, all good, all good. Uh, I, I normally uh, start this podcast by saying how we first met, but we've never met. Uh <laughs> I, but the, the thing is, I've watched that many podcasts with you and, and that video that went viral that I feel like I do know you. Uh, yeah. What was that? Because that was mad. That was on Shane Todd's podcast, the the story about the, the fag run, your stag do. And that just blew up. Like, that yeah. was crazy. It is crazy. Um, It happened years ago, obviously. But uh, I've done a show about it now. I've only done it three times. But, I mean, I've done that show again after six years last November, last October, November, and I struggled to sell 110 tickets to it. Do you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it, it's one of them ones. Everybody knew it was good stuff. It was just, it wasn't getting out there. It wasn't getting exposed. Yeah. And I think just the environment with Shane and I think his reactions in it as well, you know, him yeah. laughing at it, even though he's heard the story maybe 15 times. Um, I think it just all, the ingredients all just get put together and then everybody's seen it and it just blew right up, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. The amount of times I was sent it was just, it, it was in every uh, every group chat and it was just like, you need to, and, and then even people, so then I then spread it once someone had sent it to me, I sent it to other people and that's just how it works. So yeah. obviously a lot of the time you go on podcasts and whatever, it's, it's a lot of the time just sell tickets to shows. And it's kind of a nightmare that this came at a time when really there are no shows. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was it was crazy, crazy that way. Uh, so is the you obviously have shows in the pipeline? Hopefully that'll that'll happen yeah. when this is all sorted. Yeah, well, basically what happened was when it, it sort of started going a wee bit viral, we uh, booked a couple of shows just for the name it, just to see how we go. Actually, booked one. I just said booked one. And he was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, just one date. And it sold out in a half an hour. So he was like, we need to put another night on. So he put another night on straight away. It sold in 45 minutes. Then the next one sold. And I was like, hold on. I'm not doing, you know, 10 shows over 10 nights. Yeah. I might as well just do it once, you know. Yeah, and he was like, great, okay. So then we booked the Ulster Hall. And there's literally 100 tickets there for it. So class. it's it's good that it's happening. Like, yeah. Um, but it just shows you how things happen. You know, you're doing comedy 10 years and you're doing everything. And not that I haven't had success in a sense, but I mean, I've played big gigs. I've done the fail of five times, six times, whatever it is, the most out of anybody. Um, which is one of my favorite gigs because it's in West Belfast. And I've done it with some of the biggest acts. And I've, I've helped bring some of the biggest acts in the West Belfast to play. Mm-hmm. But I mean, in terms of for myself, it's probably, you know, it, it, it's strange that you're in this lack of doing gigs, lack of work that I'm actually getting out there, you know, and that's it's spreading. It. Things happen when you least expect them. So I mean, at least it's happening. So that's, that's a no, 100%. Plus. I can't complain. It's great. It's absolutely great. Like it, yeah. it is. And it's great. The attention and, and the, the audience now that have built up and hopefully it continues, you know? Yeah. hundred uh, percent. So growing up um, in West Belfast, like we always funny, we always like telling stories Obviously, when you were a kid, you probably didn't have that many stories. But were you always trying to make people laugh? I always, I always liked telling stories. Funny enough, I always would have impersonated people. I was always good at impressions. I could do any of the newsreaders. I could do Jerry Adams. I could do Ian Paisley. You know, so I always done stuff like that. So it was always in me mm-hmm. to entertain. Um, but I wasn't as outgoing as I would be now. You know, it wasn't until I became a teenager that. You know, right up until the age of 12, I think I wanted to be a priest and I was involved in the scouts and, you know, things like that. And yeah. my mum says she just one day I just changed and just became this teenager who was mad, you know. Yeah. And 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 it just developed from there. So it, it, I always I always liked it. I remember doing a play in 1985, I was about 15, and I hid it from my mates because they would have absolutely slayed me for it. Mm-hmm. So I knew that I liked the arts and I knew I liked performing. Yeah. You know, so I still tried to do wee bits and pieces. Yeah. A lot of the time, that's the, that's the way it was in school with me. Like when I was like I, I doing plays here, there, I would do like musicals and all because I didn't really have an, an opportunity to do like just normal plays. 
but like your mates would slay again. I'm like, lads, what you don't realize is like the amount of girls that are in these plays, like I'm talking to more girls than you could ever think about. I'm like, yeah. this is unreal. And I'm, I'm, I'm in the thick of it here. And they were like, nah, that's gay at all. I'm like, it's not gay. <laughs> like if you're not gay and you're around all these girls, well, happy days. It's oh, unbelievable. Chris. I done seven braids for seven brothers, and there was only two fellas in it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Even even the girls were playing meal parts because they couldn't get meals to do it. Yeah, you know. So it was like the perfect situation for me and him. We were delighted. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so then, like, so obviously, w- once you got a bit uh, of confidence about you, like, w- when you were like a teenager, what what type of stuff would you get up to? Like, were, were you doing plays or, or what, what were you doing? No, like, I'd I, I done that play in 95 and then I just basically got to the age where you were going to nightclubs and raves and I just hit the rave scene and it was, like, mad. It was, uh, me and my mates just went everywhere and anywhere to go and rave and do everything that you think you, you could do it then and sort of just went mental for a load of my teenage years and then I fastly met my girlfriend who's now my wife and uh, about 18 and we went to America back and forth for a couple of years and I sort of broke away from the whole madness you know yeah and then a couple of years of madness again and then I fancy settled down got a house get married stuff like that and you know I didn't do any plays didn't do anything that way that was all done um started working as a joiner and doing the door at the weekends to pay for the wedding. Got my finger bit off in 2007. A wee boy was only nine months old and I went into depression. Mm-hmm. And my wife was sort of saying to people, how, how, how do you think I'm going to get him out of this? How do, what will I do? And somebody said to her, what did he like? And she said, he loves comedy. And I'm like, take him to comedy night. So she looked up comedy, Belfast. And I don't make night came up and she contacted a guy called Graham Watson. And he says, till I bring him over on Monday night. And I went over, didn't know what was going on or anything like that. Ended up doing seven minutes. And literally, it was like, I, I could only describe it to people. It was like taking drugs and getting hooked on it the first night. Yeah. It was like, when I done it, I was like, I need to do that again. And yeah. I need to do it this week. So I was like, how do I do more and more and more? And I was all anxious, wanting to do more. Within nine months, I was doing the fail and football with Des Bishop. Like it was just Jesus, that's mad. It and was. You, it was crazy. Do you think if she hadn't have put you forward for that, you would like? Did you ever consider doing stand up? I always looked at it and always thought I'd love to do that, but I didn't know how you get into it, and I didn't look into how you get into it. If you know what I mean? Yeah. I just thought the comedians just came about from maybe acting and stuff like that. I had never even read a book about it, how a comedian came about. Yeah. The only comedian I knew about was Billy Connolly and that he got into it through music. Right. So it never even entered my head. I remember one year there was a guy, there was a guy who was in Father Ted who played Owen McLove and his name's Patrick McDonald and his name was in the field book one year. And I remember looking at that and going, imagine that was me. But I didn't, I'd done nothing about it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, so... Everything, everything that I've done and through the comedy and for getting introduced to it, I have to give to Andrea because she pushed me into it. You know, she made the first steps and got me where, where I am now, in a sense. You know? Yeah. Um, like, so you you mentioned that, it was it on the door that you got your finger bit off? Yeah, doing the door. Jesus Christ, that, that's, that's mad. Like, and like, obviously... I, I, like I wouldn't be a bouncer. I just I wouldn't wouldn't even. I've never even been in a fight, so uh, there's no way I could be a bouncer. But like, obviously there would be like fights and stuff, and you kind of have to break it up and stuff. But how how does it come about that your finger gets bit off? It's basically, a, a fight broke out in a bar, and I knew the people that was involved in the fight, and I had been outside. There was a girl. She was absolutely polaxed, and I was trying to get her in the taxi. And every time we put her in the taxi, she's getting back out. So I had been outside the bar and somebody called me to come in. I went into the bar, a fight had broke out and me and another doorman were working in the bar and we're basically just putting people out. I put one one of them out and when we got outside, he just, you know, he wasn't trying to go for me. He was trying to get back into the bar right? and then eventually he hit me a punch in the head and I turned around and then he grabbed my hand and bit my finger off. And when I done the door, like doing the door, it's not, 
there's there's branches right there get a bad name for all doormen but as mm-hmm. your doorman you have to keep people safe you have to keep bad people out and you have to protect the bar that i mean that's that's your job and when i done the door i found it easy because i can talk you yeah. know i can talk to people if somebody was so far gone you normally said tell them listen come on outside we can't hear because of the music i used to get outside and just shut the door and normally went away after five minutes you know because yeah. they get fed up but you know on the door like a few things happen but nothing like that yeah and it, was, it just shocked me it, it, mainly because i knew of the fella he was a local fella from the road had a, you know he had a good job and stuff and I was more shocked that he done it because yeah. I didn't expect it from him, you know. Yeah, well, you wouldn't expect anyone to bite your finger off. Like, that's, no. a, that's a bad thing. Because he yeah. obviously just thought, right, I got to do this. That's a, what yeah. a header. Uh, yeah. So so obviously from that, obviously that was a, a big, a nightmare thing to happen. And like you said, you, you fell in depression. But out of that came you yes. getting into comedy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and- I think that's one of I I I said I publicly said I forgive the guy for what he done now, you know for years he hated him, mm-hmm. but now I forgive him because without that I don't know if I would be where I am sort of thing you know that way. Yeah. Maybe sometimes things are meant to happen for a reason I don't know. Still you know I'd love to have part of my finger back, but <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, my life took the turn that it is. I'm very lucky of a house of children, a wife. And I have this career that I'm doing, you know, which is like a hobby that has turned into getting paid for something that you love to do, you know. 100%. So it's great that way. So uh, so after you did that open mic or whatever it was that you did, um, I, I, did you just keep doing, finding gigs and, and doing them? Yeah, basically for the first, I would say, year, I drove all over Ireland. And I mean, I literally drove all over Ireland. It was like a drug addict trying to find drugs. I yeah. just, if somebody was willing to give me make time, I went and done it. And I took the family car. I was working during the day and I was jumping in the car and I was driving till Dublin, Cork, Galway, Belfast, Derry, everywhere, just everywhere and anywhere. Yeah. And just gigged everywhere and anywhere. And I think within nine months, I'd probably done a hundred gigs, you know? So it was... I was perfecting what I had. Yeah. And I was seeing other acts. I was getting to meet other acts. And it, it sort of I honed my skills in the first year doing that. Yeah. A lot of the time I hear comedians talk about like how the best way to learn how to do do it is to get on stage. Like you just need stage times the, the way to do it. You learn yeah. by doing. And a lot of the time that's that's the way acting is as well. Like if you want to be an actor, you just gotta put yourself out there and try and be in as many things as possible and hone your craft that way. Um, so surely there was just some mad places that you ended up like, because there's not that many comedy clubs. There's not like a, a, a one comedy club here. So like, would it be in like GA clubs and all the rest of it? Yeah, you would have it in, in gilly clubs. You would have it in rugby clubs. You would have it, you know, youth clubs, church halls. You know, we were good doing gigs but i also hit it at the time there seemed to be quite a few people trying it out so when mm-hmm. people were trying it out in order to get gigs they were putting on gigs right. so they're putting on gigs for organizations that they were involved in or charities or youth clubs or you know rent in the hall so we were just doing these gigs a lot of them were open mic and then down south you had quite a bit of people who were doing gigs like in random towns and stuff and I just messaged them and I was getting gigs because they were going, well, if he's willing to drive down, we'll give him a go. And we don't have to pay him because that's what I was saying. You don't have to pay me. I'll come down and do it. If you like me, then you can get me the next time, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's that's basically what I was doing. So I was lucky enough at the time there was quite a few gigs that way. Now, in terms of main comedy gigs, you had the Empire on a Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. And that was the only gig in Belfast that was constant. Yeah, And you couldn't just walk in and get a gig in it. You know, it took me, I think, six months to get five minutes in it. Yeah. And once I got the five minutes, I didn't get another five minutes until like a year later. You know, so it was, that's my local gig. And and yet, you know, I wasn't getting a gig in it. I flew to Scotland, flew to Edinburgh, flew to Glasgow, Manchester, Liverpool, 
London, just all to get gigs. Like, it was just yeah. going everywhere. So where where was like the, the worst gig that you had? Like what would what would be the worst one that you had? The worst the worst gig that I had. I, I, I started doing weddings and stuff after maybe two years, and I, and it took me a while to click on about weddings. That the best time to do. I only do weddings now if I'm on directly after speeches because if you try and do it that night, nobody listens to a comedian. You know, yeah. everybody is drunk. They've been drinking all day. Um, so weddings were always pretty bad. But in terms of a gig. There's a wee town called Derry Gunley down in uh, Enniskill, just outside Enniskill. It's on the border. And this guy had contacted me and says, look, every year we do this gig in the community centre. And I sent him a DVD of my stuff. And I says, look, that's pretty much my worst stuff there, like the dirty ways and whatever. Have a look at it. If you think it's for you, let me know. And he was like, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, no problem. Come on down. And I went down. There was a community hall. There was about a thousand people in it. And they were all having a dinner at the start. So it was like the Waltons, everybody was bringing dinners in. So it was just everybody in this town was in, in the hall from the old to the young. And I get up and they had booked me for 30 minutes. And literally they were walking around the hall saying, don't laugh, don't laugh. And I, I stayed on for 30 minutes. I literally counted the last 10 seconds down in front of them on the stage. And I said, I was told I'm doing 30 minutes. I'm doing the 30 minutes. I'm professional. And I got off stage and I, I, I drove out of the town looking over my shoulder. And what it was, was after I got off, the chief of police down there got on stage and says, that's an example of somebody from a segregated community. You know, <laughs> and it was just, it was horrendous. It was really horrendous. And uh, then a girl contacted me from the audience and she was like, they just didn't like the first line of your joke. And I was like, what, what did I say? And he says, there was war veterans at the front, and he says, Jesus, is it no boys over here tonight or something? It was something stupid, but it was like, because you disrespect the demons, they told everybody not to laugh. And I was like, Jesus, that's a bit mad booking a comedian and then saying to the audience, yeah, don't, don't laugh, because that yeah. first joke within like, so don't laugh. So it was the worst gig. I, I mean, I remember driving home, just shaking my head the whole way up the motorway, just going to myself. I don't want to do this anymore. That was absolutely horrendous. That was like the worst 30 minutes of my life. It yeah. felt like a lifetime. Um, but I mean, I've had other gigs where I had a guy in Casabell and jumped on the streets and tried to hit me. Jesus. The day of the FA Cup final, I was doing a gig in Casabell. And so, I mean, you could pick things like that, but I didn't even have that down as my worst gig. You know, probably... Why, why did he try and hit you? He was absolutely full and he came to see the guy. I was on with the guy, Darren Farley, who was, he does the imitations of like football managers and footballers and does the choral uh, thing. So he's from Liverpool, this guy. He's quite well known. So this guy came into the bar, paid the money and I was on stage and he went, you took me on. This is the wrong guy and all. And I was going to mate, sit down, just sit down. You'll enjoy it. He's on next. I know who you And he's going, don't you tell me you would sit down. And he ran up the stage and tried to <laughs> Jesus Christ. So it was mental because it was the FA Cup final day. They'd been all out drinking all day. Uh, um, but I mean, other than that, I've never really had too many disasters, if you know what I mean. Yeah. You know? See, um, <clears throat> like I, I've never done stand-up, but I can imagine, th- obviously, the best... Uh, like suggestion to do comedy is when the people know that there's gonna be a comedian. Hundred percent. So then, like sometimes, like you said, doing weddings and stuff. Like if people don't know there there's a comedian, like a lot of the time, the the funniest thing that happens at a wedding is just the best man speech slags the slags the groom, and then that's it. Everyone gets blocked. But like if you ha- actually have a professional comedian coming on, and so yeah. do you have to do like jokes about them? Yeah. So it, it really it depends what they want. Um, I done a wedding there and I says, you need to give me people who can take a slagging because some people can tell you to slag this person, slag that person. You don't know if that really annoys that person or yeah. it could affect them. And I done a wedding in Newcastle and this guy was like, this is my uncle and, you know, this is stories about him. And when I was in the house, I was telling my dad about the wedding and he says, I know him. And I was like, right. And he says, I'm going to tell you stuff that nobody at that wedding is going to know. So when I came in and started slagging him, he, he was saying back to me, I, everybody knows them stories. I says, I don't know this. And then I started telling stories of things that he ha- that happened to him at school. 
and he was like pure red, and everybody was in stitches and going, "Is this true?" And he's going, "How do you know this? How do you know this?" No, he had no idea, and it was brilliant, you know. Um, so there's likes of that. Um, so yeah, they, they get to the do different things. I did do one wedding where the girl's daddy was the head of the Orange Order in Pomeroy, and the fella's daddy was the head of some GA club in Cool Island, and they got married on Boxing Day right. in Palomina. And Celtic and Rangers were playing. <laughs> and they said to me, we don't want you to mention religion. We don't want you to mention sex. We don't want you to mention uh, the Orange Order. We don't want you to mention the GAA. We don't want you to mention the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church. And I says, is there anything left that you want me to talk about? <laughs> yeah. like, you know what I mean? You're, you're, you have a wedding between two different religions on a day called Boxing Day in Balamina, you know, with a Celtic and Rangers match playing. Here's me, if pretty much low jagged do there? No, we don't want to mention it, you know. And I was like, why does he even get a comedian? Because he's had no sense of humor. I know, because the jokes pretty much write themselves there. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, uh, I like, I um, I would always think it's really hard. Like, if you are going up and doing a set, and maybe it's just the the audience are getting it, or they're just not laughing, like. Do you not just feel sometimes that you just want the ground to swallow you up whole? Like that would just stress the life out of me. Because I watched uh, there's there's a podcast called Kill Tony. It's like a live podcast, and they do it in a comedy club, and they do it, they pick names out of a hat, and and you do a minute of stand up. But a lot of the time, the comedians go up and they just bomb, and no one laughs, and you can just see in their eyes they're just like, oh, this is this doesn't didn't play out the way I had it in my head. Like does that happen? Like what? 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 Goes, like do you try and save it? Do you go yeah. off script to try and save yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And I think if you have stuff in your armor, like everybody would have knew me as a slagger. You know, that's not what I do in stand up now. But God help anybody if they come to my gig and they try and you know shout out and torture me while I'm trying to do a set because I will go through them and I I have such a tongue like you know I. Yeah. I can come off of stuff and they'd be absolutely embarrassed. And a lot of the times I'd be hanging about the place before it and you can overhear conversations and you, and I can read a room and read people. And sometimes I can near enough see who's going to say something. So I find out about them or, you know, just try and listen in or see if they've bought a drink while they're drinking, you know, just something to have. Yeah. And you just go through them. And that's the secret of it. You have a microphone and it's just being louder without actually harming them. Yeah, you just have to belittle them and then just make them go, Whoa, I needn't say anything here because this guy's gonna, you know. And then if they just keep going, keep going, keep going, like there's not much else you can do. There's a girl one time was at a gig and she wouldn't, she just wouldn't stop talking and she was absolutely pissed like. But uh, they ended up they just had to put her in the bar because nothing was fizzing her, but she was spoiling the whole night for everybody, you know, that Mm -hmm. way. But yeah, no, it's it's it, you just have to be prepared for it. I, I I'm pretty much okay because I'm good and quick on my feet. Like some myself and you would see people like Mickey Bartlett, you know, or Kieran Bartlett, any of the two of them and or me, if anybody shouts out at their shows, they're in trouble because we're very quick thinkers on our feet and we can mm-hmm. normally make the feel that says. Yeah. So it's all factors that happen, you know, and and you do it. But the thing about stand up, it's it's not like acting, whereas if you forget a line or you do something wrong in a play. Like it happened to me a couple of times in a play where there was one one play we were doing in particular, me and the New York guy missed out the whole plot of the story at the very start. And we didn't realize until we came off at the break of the first bit. And we then had to figure out how to say the plot back again. And we destroyed the play, like absolutely destroyed it. And what both were saying afterwards, I was saying like if that was stand up comedy, you'd get away with it because you're doing other material. Yeah. Whereas in the acting like you've just and that that was harder. I found it harder. I found it harder doing plays and stuff like that because it's scripted. Whereas yeah. with the, the stand up comedy, although you can say it's scripted, I don't really write anything down. A lot of comedians will write in their hands or go through material. I just have loads of material in my head. Mm-hmm. And I just go out and do it. And some of my best bits would just come to me when I'm on stage or if something's said or I just do something or I've seen something on the way in or thought about something and I'll try it. And some of my best bits just came from me thinking of it 
on stage or you know trying it out on stage just that quickly yeah so it's a lot easier than I, feel, I feel like people from here think because everyone's a slagger here like everyone thinks they're funny thinks they're a comedian and i used to do stage management for a theater company it was you know tony devlin did you yeah, yeah, uh, yeah so i was working for tony devlin and a lot of their shows would be like one-man plays and we were doing a one-man play in the rallies once and it's a one-man play it's scripted it's got a storyline it's funny but like it, it can be quite sad at times and there's people in the audience that for some reason think it's like stand-up so we're like heckling but i felt so bad for the actor because they can't like really go back at them because yeah, they're yeah. not really the wall. Yeah. yeah they're not really in the rallies but so yeah. it's 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 better for a comedian because you could just be like right shut up or whatever and slag yeah. but yeah. with it with a with a play like you just gotta stick to your guns and just try and par through i always find that so hard because that that's what you find so often is people think that they're so funny and they're they're not even they're trying to make the four people that they came with laugh it's not even about it for everybody else exactly <laughs> like, yeah, what, was, what, what do you hear this i was in one in the rallies and it was a tony devlin play it was a one man and there was a bit of rave music in the actual play and two girls beside me got up and started started shouting you and re- i swore me and my wife were sitting there and i was like oh my god i was probably the best it was one of my favorite plays and i I remember sitting there going, thank God it's not just comedy because, you know, w- when we started doing the fila, I had done it till, I think it was 900 people in Bank Square with Des Bishop. And I get on, I, how hard I done it was I came on stage with a balaclava, right? And a black leather jacket. And people was going, shush, there's going to be a statement here, shush, no, right? <laughs> and I get up and, and was doing this bit with a balaclava, walked off, took the balaclava off and my leather jacket and walked back on. And genuinely, about 20 people in the audience went, Paddy, get off, get off. I was like, what are you doing? And I was like, no, I'm here to do comedy. And then I went into it. And people didn't even know I was doing comedy. So they were like, what's he doing? And then it worked. You know, everybody enjoyed it, whatever like that. But uh, I know it's, it, West Belfast is, it's that type of place. You're 100% right. And, and my wife will say to me, will you stop trying to do comedy in West Belfast? Because it doesn't work. And it's mostly because of that reason. And probably so many people know you in West Belfast, so they feel like, oh, why is it funny? Shut up. But, like, that's that's difficult. It is. Um, so, see, when you're, like, uh, writing a set, or, uh, like you said, you don't you normally just have the material in your head. Do you ever sit and write jokes or, or write a story? Obviously, a lot of your stories are, well, your, all your stories are, are true, so... Do you ever write them out to, to tell them in, in a certain way, or what, what way do you do? I, I started at one stage writing, you know, on pieces of paper, and I would just maybe write what the story's about or what the joke's about. I never fully written something out, I've never scripted it. Um, you know, so if I am doing a list, the likes of the fail gigs, I remember had a white page because I seen one of other big comedians doing it, and I went, That's a good idea because I can go off on a tangent. And then I need to come back. But like Billy Connolly, I was probably watching him for years. That's why I do it. But I wrote it down just, you know, so it'll just be like, you know, say it was about the stag do, it's just stag do, you know, being a daddy, taxi, fag run, you know. So it literally be one or two words. Yeah. If it ever is written down. I've never sat and fully scripted out. The only time I done that was Tony's translated. I wanted to do a sat narrative. And Tony translated the set for me, and that was scripted in Irish, and that's the only time I've ever done it. Stand up, yeah. Stand up in Irish, like uh, obviously everyone in the audience are uh, Gale Gores. That they, well, you, would, you would think that, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you see, what happened was we done it in the Culterland, and it was a big hit. So. The ones from Culterland and Tony and Nuala McCusker decided they had these sketches, comedy sketches in Irish. And the the ones in Culterland, Aisling Gear says, we want to put this in as part of the comedy festival in the Opera House. And I was like, that's great because it went well. So we'll give it a go. So it was basically me going on doing 15 minutes. I start off talking English and then by the end of it, I'm fully talking Irish. Mm-hmm. And it's in, in Irish, you know. And... It, it was all set up with done a, a promo video and all, and it was all a great time. And I went to Edinburgh and done five days in Edinburgh. 
And when I came back, I met a promoter and he says, look, I've booked a gig for theatre in the mill and the comedian can't do it. But would you stand in because you live over there? And I was like, yeah. So I went out and done the theatre in the mill to like 250 people from New Mosley, Ralph Fern, Ralph Cool, And they all loved it. And they were like, when are you on next? And I says, well, I have a show during the, the Belfast Comedy Festival. And they says, we'll look it up, we'll look it up. I had my own show that I was doing, and I was also doing that Irish one. So the Irish one, it was a wee tiny booklet just for the fringe. And they went, we'll go to the opera house and see him. So we turned up. The Lord Mayor was Martin O'Mooler. And we turned up. The place was sold out. Tony's like, this place sold out. This is brilliant. And I was like, right. So I get it all on. We'll play the video. I come out, start talking English, and everybody's enjoying it. And then when I started going in the Irish, all these people started going, here, what are you doing? What are you, what's this? I don't understand you. Know? And I was going, what's going on here? And I seen the Lord Murr crouching down. And I physically had to stop my set. And I went, what's the matter? And somebody shouted, we went to see you in the theatre in the mill. And there's two busloads just here from, from Ralph Coote. And what are you talking? What's all this you're talking? And I was going, <laughs> it's Irish. And they were going, what the fuck are you doing that for? You know, and I was like, <laughs> oh, this is, you told us to come and see you. I said, I mean, it may have been the wrong cue. You've given to see him. You know, this is an Irish. I mean, listen, the start of it starts off in English. You get the gist of it. It's me, it's me talking about being a daddy and my kids learning the Irish and whatever. I says, I'm only on for another five minutes. Let me finish. I says, Tony and Nuda's coming on next. I says, they, they weren't translating mine because it probably doesn't make sense in Irish, never mind English. I says, but their sketches are fantastic and everything's translated on the wee, you know, earphones. Uh-huh. And they're like, right, right, right. So after I finished, I had to do in Irish. Um, everybody got tickets and they could win prizes. And the prizes were like a packet of potato, cheese and onion from Arn Islands in Irish. Two tickets to the Gale Top. You know, it was like, you couldn't have picked the worst prize. It was like a Celtic cap in Irish or something. You know, it was just, and all these people were winning them. And I, I was going, so I just went, you know what? You don't want that. You don't want that. Yeah. I'm just kidding that. There's no way you'll want that. You know, because they they won everything. I don't, I don't, yeah. just, I got to pick out. And I went, and Martin Muller literally scrolled down in a seat. Jerry Adams' wife stood up and told him to be quiet. And I was like, this, this can't get any worse. That's like this a, a comedy sketch in itself. In, in itself, it is. It was like a follower head scene. <laughs> and I literally came off stage and my mate wasn't turned off. And <laughs> apparently in the room, all you could hear is, what the fuck happened out there? <laughs> I'm sure you love it. Tony and Nula's freaking out. And I'm like, you'll be all right because you're doing it's translated. And Tony went, I know, I know, I know. So they all sat down. The first scene was Tony going into a classroom, learning Irish, and Nula was a teacher. And Tony's first line in it was, fuck, I'm just down from a Glen Road there. I was, I was using the RPG or something. And they all sort of perked up. And then he started saying in Irish, in Irish that he didn't like orange men. But it translated different, you know, because in Irish, in Irish, an orange man's a yellow man, right? right. A black man's a blue man. So it was, it was, it was that kind of joke. But all yeah. they could hear is, I don't like orange men. So they all took their mics off, <laughs> threw them, their earphones off, threw them down and stormed out. And there was a protest outside the opera house. And we had to stay in the opera house for by ages. them. I like they wanted their money back. <laughs> like they all demanded it was like 120 people and they wanted their money back. Jesus and they wanted God. money for the buses and all because they came from Raf Crew because they were missold this gig. And I was like, I was sitting out the back, and Connor Grimes and McKee were there with Avon Little doing another play and part of the opera house, and they were in stitches. And I was go, I'm looking out over it. Sinn Fein were doing their dinner in the Europa Hotel, and it was just it was surreal. It was all happening. And here's me. just going like, be a mass rat outside here. And a guy from the Belfast Telegraph come up and he says, I have here a review of this show, Paddy. And he says, I reviewed your other show. And it was fantastic. He says, that was fantastic, but for all the wrong reasons. He says, I can either put it in or I can't. He says, if I put it in the paper, I think you'll be on Stephen Nolan. He says, and I don't know if that's good or bad for you. He says, so I'm going to hand it to you. If you want me to print it, give me it back. If you don't, then it's yours. And I never give him it back. So it was, you know, it's just mental. So you would think that people would come till, and I've never done that as stand up, and I actually should do. Like it's a, it's a great bit. Yeah. Where you, where they turned up at a gig, and as you say, it's like a comedy sketch in its own right. It's only something that would happen in Belfast. <laughs> yeah, 
That's Tony, <laughs> Tony Davlin was involved. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine him freaking out. <laughs> what uh, do we do? Um, so like stuff like that, like having gigs like that that just it ends up being chaos and any time that people maybe aren't liking it, has it ever put you off doing stand up? Definitely not. When I, when when I've had a bad gig, especially that one night, that one on Derry Galley on the way home. Yeah, I was sitting going to myself, do you know what? That was horrendous. Um, but I knew it wasn't my material. I knew it was just I was in the wrong situation or circumstances and I hadn't read the room right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I should have been more culture oriented and more sort of wholesome material. So I think it spurs you on. When I've had real bad gigs, the next one I've normally stormed because it's pushed me on to perform better. Do you know that way? Yeah. Um, see, with obviously you, you said you've done acting, and you've done plays and all, and then I've seen you in uh, a few of uh, Shane Todd's uh, sketches online. Have you ever thought like seriously about getting into acting? I, do you know what? I think it's really hard. And stand up is one of them. I, I think I've became lazy. I love acting and I would love to maybe do, I've, I've written a few things, short things that I would love to do that's serious, that's not comedy related. And I wouldn't mind seeing if if maybe I can write that stuff and, I, and it's any good, but also if I could do serious stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would love to try it, but I think acting's really hard. I mean, it's it's very time consuming. And when you're involved in it, like you, you know, you, you're stuck that I can go out and do things all day with the kids or the wife. If I have a gig at half eight, say on the on my road, I leave here quarter to eight and I don't have to plan anything. Yeah. And I basically walk in there, grab a mic, do whatever, and then I come back home again. Whereas when I'm doing the plays, as you, as you well know, you, you, you're you doing rehearsals for weeks and it's like full time. And then when the, the plays happen that night, like you can't basically do much that day. You can't do things, but you're sort of going back and forth and, and, so it's very time consuming mm-hmm. and it's very hard. I think it's a lot harder. So I think the stand up's just that wee bit easier and a wee bit easier to, to make money at. But I would, I would love, I would love to do, do acting and, and try and do a wee bit of serious stuff and comedy acting as well. Like. Mm-hmm. But I, I think it just gets said in the comedy, you know, that way. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of your, like, I know a lot of American comedians a lot of time, sometimes a, a bit that they've written, they end up turning into like say like a sitcom or whatever but a lot of the stories a lot of the things that have happened to you in your life would be on um, like n- not like a give my head piece type thing but like similar to that like a, a, a being acted you being on it like that would be unbelievable because the amount of things that have happened to you and if you've seen them like acted out it would be unbelievable yeah yeah no it's it's one of them there's a guy at the minute has been talking to me about doing a documentary because he says it wouldn't be right to do the stag do, because he says your stag do is very similar to the Hangover movie. But mm-hmm. my stag do happened before that. So he says, I know you didn't copy that when you're doing comedy. <laughs> but he says, you know, it's sort of been done as in terms of a film. But he says, as a documentary, maybe you reliving it with a couple of the people that's in it and taking these away. And then you doing stand up in between talking, you know, doing the stand up about that actual yeah. thing. He says, it might work that way. But yeah, no, it's just a lot of stuff that I could definitely put out there at the minute. I'm working for Netflix. I'm building sets because I'm a joiner by trade. Mm-hmm. So obviously there's no comedy at the minute. So I'm down there building sets. And it's it's strange because a lot of the people, all the bosses know exactly who I am. And then all the workers, the whispers have went round. We're all wearing masks and stuff, but everybody sort of knows that I'm a stand-up now. Mm-hmm. And this, this show that I'm doing is called On The Tools. And it did bring it till the BBC before and says, tell them we could do on the tools where it's me and I'm out there and talking to different people in the different shapes of jobs that I've done and, and then me doing comedy in between it. And uh, the guys down there are going, Jesus, it'd be really fitting now. Like if you were doing, you know, if Netflix was to come and film you actually building the sets for this yeah. thing and then you are doing your show in the Ulster Hall at the end of the year, he says yeah. it would be fantastic. Oh, it would be class. Uh, and they were sort of saying like, think of the stories you're getting out of down here well there, there hasn't been too many yet like, but it, it's it is it's strange that way strange well, it it's is. so mad before before comedy and uh, even during it the amount of like you've had so many different jobs like were you a taxi driver 
taxi driver, black Wait, taxi driver. Black ta- so going up and down the road? Up and down the falls and then ended up in the town. So what basically happened when I got the finger bit off, I had a like a loft and and extension company, you know, and journey, you know, during the day. And I couldn't do it because of my hand. So mm-hmm. I lost that and I wouldn't do the door anymore. So I basically had to do work. So I went and got a PSG badge and, and started taxiing until I could get my hands fixed. And I ended up taxiing for about five, six years on the full road. You know, so there's a mountain of material I have about that. Yeah. You know, there's a sitcom in that. Yeah, <laughs> 100%. Down it, in there, the train. It's my, my, my mates, because uh, I went to drama school in England, and for my birthday, like two years ago, they all came over for the d- d- Belfast for like a, a few nights out. And uh, they just, co- so I, I, where I live, like you just walk out and you're on the road where the black taxis are. And they were like, right, uh, how do we get into town? I was like, I would just get a black taxi. And then they were like, okay, has someone ordered it or whatever? I was like, no, no, there's one there. So you stick your hand out. And they're like, what are you doing? And there was people in it. I was like, well, three of us will get in this one and then you just wait on the next one. And they're like, what? Why, why are you in someone's taxi? And then they yeah. just couldn't believe that, like, from my house to the town, you maybe pass, like, four churches and people would be having conversations and then in the middle of it, they'd just be like, I right, so our Sharon was doing... Uh, and, they walk, and it's like it's like robotic. They all do it. They're like, "What is going on here?" And then bang in the window with a pound coin. It was just like seeing English people experience that. They're just like, "What is going well, on here?" This blows the world. absolutely blows them out of the water. And then I was doing the tours, obviously because I could talk mm-hmm. and I could read. So I was doing the tours, and and I got pretty good at the tour. So if anybody sort of with any importance was coming to Belfast, I started getting all these tours, you know, to, to promote it. And I ended up with the, your woman. She used to be a superman. And she went with uh, Meg Jagger, Janice Dickinson. I don't oh, know. Yeah. If you know her. Yeah, yeah. Right? So she was brought. And what it was, was they're trying to get Americans to come to Belfast from Killarney and Cork, because they always tend to go down south. They, they won't find sure up here. Mm-hmm. So this tour operator was trying to get them up. So they were bringing these celebrities on buses to bring people up. And she was one of them. And I'd done the tour. It was about an hour and a half. So there was me doing a tour. And then they had this like blue badge woman from the town doing a tour. So basically, I done the tour as a person from the road, West Belfast, you know, a commoner in a sense. Okay. And apparently, when I get off the bus, your woman says, "I'm going to do the tour," and I don't listen to anything she said, uh, anything he said. And she she done about twenty five minutes, and Janice Dickinson stood up and says, "You need to get off the bus because you were very rude about that first gentleman, and also you're very boring, and he wasn't." <laughs> and they put your woman off the bus and uh, Janice Dickinson came back with her nephew and his wife to do a gig, to do a tour with me and we'd done the tour and we got to the Falls Road which was the end of the tour and I'm talking about the Irish language and stuff like that on the international wall and that there's a radio station and that the kids here and blah 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 and, and her nephew was going that's amazing, that's amazing and she was like yeah and this tour is done in Irish and I was like no and she was like, yeah, the last tour you done was in Irish. And, and like most of this was done in Irish. And I was like, no, that was all English both times. And she was like, oh, and here's me. Did you not understand that thing I was telling you? Like those both times. And she was like, I just thought you were you're like funny and cute and fat. So I just liked it. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> she didn't understand the word I said. I was going, are these people doing all these tours? And I think they're having a great time. They're having a clue what I'm saying because I speak pure West Belfast. Yeah. You know? should, should have had Tony Devlin translate them for you. Oh, Jesus. Uh, that's so funny. My brothers, they used to work for, uh, you know, the buses, the bus tours. Mm-hmm. And it's mad. Like, it's it's like West Side Story, you know, the gangs against each other. So you've got the red coats and the blue coats. And they, like, hate right. each other. And, the fight. Uh, oh, fighting all the time, like behind the alleyways and all. Be like, like someone would steal, like a tourist. Be like, uh, here we'll do it for a tenner. Well, we'll do it for eight quid. So they're gonna go for the eight quid one, and then like you bastard, right? So they take off their coats and go round the back and fight each other. For I'm like, what? And they tell and me these stories. So I'm like, why is that? The maddest, I don't know if your brothers have told you this, but there was a wee Chinese guy called Lee, and he worked for the blue coats, mm-hmm. right? And he would give me tours, but because he worked for. 
the blue coats, which were a Protestant bus company, he used mm-hmm. to say to me, and he had the broadest Belfast accent, right? <laughs> so he used to go to me, don't you fucking tell nobody I ain't giving a thing in all these tours. <laughs> <laughs> I've been going lazy if somebody seen you saying that like they wouldn't even put that he says no no your man I work for we're a Protestant company I can't be giving them to people from the falls but you're good and I always get tips so listen don't you tell nobody at all he would have made me hate to get the tour and then I had to go and pay him and he used to go to me don't hand me money in public I don't want people to know I don't want people to know that I associate with Catholics and I'm looking at him going you Chinese <laughs> like, I grew up in East Belfast mate I'm a president <laughs> and I was going to... he just don't know. <laughs> it was funny like that's a cracker. I've seen him about to be fair. He's like yeah. sitting side to and turns like there's no way that's coming out of his mouth. Yeah. Uh, it's a gag. Um so uh with obviously lockdown and all, what um what are your plans for the future? Obviously you have that show in the Ulster Hall coming up. When is that? I have the show in the Ulster Hall and uh you know, a few things in the paper and hopefully stuff like that documentary gets done and I have a very few sketches I want to get out there. So maybe just do we sketches for people to entertain them tried to do sort of the Zoom gigs for people online. I didn't really like them, to be honest with you. I like the audience participation and the feedback. Uh, and I'm going to start a podcast here. So get the podcast out and maybe get a wee bit more, you know, people seeing me getting a wee bit of content out there for them. Mm-hmm. Just trying to push it on to the next level. I'd, okay. i tell you what I would love. I would love eventually for like Casement Park to get built and to have like a proper you know, a, like a big thing for like failure or something in it. And anybody that does comedy now, not everybody speaks to each other that's from West Belfast that does comedy, but I mean, I don't have any fights with anybody. It would just be great to do like one big West Belfast comedy night in casement. Like it would be yeah, amazing. You know? That would be absolutely unreal. So uh, just to finish off, what advice would you give for anyone looking in, looking to get into comedy or anyone who's already in it and needs a bit of a push? I think just if you're getting into comedy, just search out for the open mix and just try and get a comedy night to go and try it. Try it first because like the likes of Ardo Hanlon, who was far Dougal and far Ted, he's physically sick before he goes on stage, you know. And people would be shocked to hear that. But a lot of the big comedians I know, you know one thing they always say to me is like there's no you you aren't scared. We can tell you aren't scared. You know, mm-hmm. I met Jack uh, Whitehall in the comedy store in London and he didn't speak to me and I thought he was being ignorant but now that I know Jack and, and he's got talking to me you know and through a mutual friend now and he comes to Belfast to play football and I would help him out with changing his stuff to make it more local he was telling me that I raved in in work gear in London with this big Belfast accent and just came into the green room and was just like well what's happening what's a crack and he was just like oh my god what he says, I, th- I didn't know whether you were going to kill me. I didn't know. <laughs> he says, I just felt threatened. He says, so I just sat there like a wee boy. He says, I thought you were like the biggest comedian in Ireland. I just was going, what? And you were in work clothes and all. And I was going, I don't know what's going on here. He says, I was just in shock. So it's one of them ones, just go out and do, do the gigs and try and get them where you can. Obviously, at the minute, there's not going to be anything. Once you get on stage, once you're not frightened or anything, you know, just keep doing it and you'll get better at it. Hone your skills, find what you like doing and find out what people like. Some people go on to comedy and try to be Frankie Boyle, be very controversial from the start. Mm-hmm. And you're not, people need to like you first. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's like a wee law. You, you, your first 10 minutes, don't do anything. It's going to make people dislike you. Get them on board, make the people like you and then do it. And also if you're doing stuff you like, you'll enjoy it as much as the audience is going to enjoy it if you're good at it. So that's the only advice I give to people. 100%. Pat, Patty, thanks very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. 100%. Uh, you're a gent. Cheers. All right, Chris, all the best. So you have it, folks. That was Paddy McDonald. Next week, I'm joined by Brendan Quinn, a young but very, very talented actor. So tune in next week for that. If you could, tell your friends about the podcast, like and subscribe to the video. This has been Play and Pretend with Chris McIlvenny. See you next week.